This interview is being conducted for St John Scotland, 75 years of making a difference. My name is Dr Sue Morrison and the respondent is Gwen Fullerton. This is the 10th of January 2022 and the interview is taking place in Inverness. Thank you very much for agreeing to be interviewed for the project. Gwen. You're quite welcome. For the record, would you please confirm your full name? It's Gwen Elizabeth Fullerton. Thank you. And could you give me either your age or just your year of birth? Um, I was born in 1949. Thank you. Where were you brought up? I was born and brought up in Newcastle upon Tyne. Could you yes. tell me a wee bit about that, please? That was it was lovely. I had a, a I had a very good childhood. Um, my father came from a big family. He was one of seven. Lots of uncles, and aunts, and cousins, and I always remember as a child every Sunday without fail, <coughs> three or four carloads of family and cousins, and we would go away anywhere, just anywhere. Um, we might just go from Newcastle down to the coast, Wickley Bay or Blythe, or we might go to Edinburgh, we might go to Nesborough, we might go to the lakes, but we had a day out and took picnic lunches and everything with us. Unfortunately, my father died when I was only 10, and my brother was only two. Um, I have a sister in the middle as well, she was four, and obviously that all stopped because he was obviously one of the main drivers but we still had a very happy childhood and my mother did everything that she could for the three of us she brought the three of us up and I can consider she brought us up very well very well indeed she was a very um she was very independent like myself very, a very strong person knew what she wanted and it was always a case of if she was able to, uh, if we wanted something, if she was able to get it for us, we got it. If she wasn't, we understood that she couldn't do it. So, and she, and she had to go out to work, obviously, when we were younger. So it was a case of, obviously, the oldest helping to bring up the youngest. Um, but no, it was good. I thoroughly enjoyed my childhood. I, really, I, I can't complain about it at all. And Newcastle was a super place to be. It really was. Um, lots going on. Uh, the city centre itself, we lived outside the city, but the city self, the centre itself was, uh, to us, was a marvellous place. It really was a marvellous place. And then we moved to the coast when I was in my middle teens, lived at Whitley Bay, and that's where the family home still is, in Whitley Bay. And now um, I only have my sister there. My brother lives in America, but we still are in touch with each other every single week, all the time. And um, that is it, really. I started, uh, I did my nurse training in Newcastle upon Tyne. I started in 1967. And uh, that was brilliant. That was really brilliant. And that has been my sort of mainstay all the way through my, my life, is my nursing. <laughs> you then went on to have your own family. Could you tell me about that? Yes, well, I um, I met my husband um, actually when I was on holiday abroad. Uh, he was in the army and my friend that I went on holiday with, her sister, was married to an army person. We went to stay with them and I met him and uh, we subsequently got married and then I had two children, both born abroad. My son was born in Berlin, Kirsty was born in Munster. Um, and uh, we travelled, oh, quite a lot. We were in a place, the first place was a place called Horner Bergen, um, which is um, north of Hanover. And then we went to Berlin, as I say, where Kenneth was born. Then we back to back to Katrick, back out to uh, Germany again, to a place called Munster. Um, then we, Kirsty was born there. We went back to my husband, taught in schools in Bovington, back to Munster, and then he was posted to Inverness, and that's how we come to live in Inverness. When was that? 1982, when we moved to Inverness, and we've been here ever since. Were you working at that point? I didn't work when we were abroad, not nursing. I didn't do any nursing when we were abroad, but every time we were in the UK, I nurse, I got a nursing job and I started work in 1983 here in Inverness and worked right through till I retired 
got to think now. Five years ago. Is yeah, that a really five one? years I worked. No, I worked first of all in the small hospital here in Inverness uh, called Hilton Hospital. And then the, the, that moved, it was care for the elderly, we moved to the Royal Northern Infirmary. And I left there and I went to manage a nursing home here in Inverness that was newly commissioned. I worked there for 10 years and then went back into re work for the first time ever worked in Rigmore till I retired. We've done all sorts, you know, we had, a, as I say, we had a very busy, fulfilling life. We didn't leave Inverness uh, when the children um, grew up because they, just as um, my husband came out of the army, the oldest boy, he was starting his O-levels. When he stopped in his O-levels, my daughter started hers. So we bought a house here and we settled and we've been here, as I say, ever since. Never, never wanted to move. It's a nice enough place as Inverness, it really is. Two seconds and you're out in the country. Mm -hmm. It's you beautiful know, right It there. is, yeah. There's so much to see. Mm -hmm. Right, could I ask you then, um, how you first came into contact with St John's Scotland? Yes, it was a roundabout way. My husband was the first one who was... Uh, made contact with um, St John Scotland. He was manager of a factory down in the Longman at the time, and there was a uh, Alec Crabe and a gentleman uh, Alan Wilson uh, approached him about doing some work for them for the uh, the order because they were working with um, children coming over from Chernobyl at that point, and he worked with them. And he sort of looked into what St John was all about and he worked with them um, for a couple of years and then um, he was asked if he would like to become a member of St John. So it was a roundabout way through that because he was a great one for history and he delved into the history of St John um, way, way back to the Crusades and everything. He loved all of that. And of course he used to tell Kirsty and I and whatever they did we supported as a family group we did everything together so whenever they had any fundraising or events or needed any help of any kind we all did it you know all together so that is how i became involved with saint john um in the first place and it was through my husband doing work for the order um here in the a uh, in Venice. Would you just confirm your husband's name for us? Was it record? Robert Fullerton? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, what was your your own first involvement? What did you do with St John's Scotland? Well, as I say, any events that they had, you know, any fundraising, didn't matter what it was. I would be there helping. I would do anything that I could to help. Um, even as I say, there's they were they would take when the Chernobyl children were here they would take the children out for days out and I would go along as well because obviously they needed um, adult members with them, with the children. So that was more or less the first thing that I did. It's coffee mornings, um, you name it. Um, we did all sorts. Um, and as I say before, I actually became very actively as a member um, because we had the association then as well. There was a... so. I think Bob became involved and was enrolled in a, the Order of St John. Kirsty and I joined the association. And then over the next two or three years after that, um, she became, she was invested into the Order. And then after her, I was invested into the Order. And we just built it up. I think Kirsty was, um, for the association, she was secretary to Alec at one point. Um, so she she did all of that, and as I say, we just we did everything together. So it didn't matter whether it was for the Order of Saint John or it was for some other organisation, the Scouts that the kids were involved in, um, anything like that. We all did it, and we all supported everything together. You know, we just did the whole lot, whatever. Whether it was making sandwiches, a cup of tea, we did it, and that was it. What was your favourite event? My favourite events was after long, a good while after I was uh, in, I'd, uh, enrolled in the order, I organised three fashion shows 
three years running uh, because we um I had been to another meeting um and got involved I heard about a lady who worked in the children's ward in Rigmore Hospital um actually called play therapists now it sounds as if all they do is play with children but they do an awful lot more than that and they were struggling to be able to provide things for the children and I put it to the committee one day could we help them in any shape or form and um I told them all about what she did she would have come along and described but I didn't need to I think I must have sold it to them well enough they said yes and I said I would like to do a fashion show and um but they decided they would support them for the children's ward for three years so we did a fashion show three years running specifically for that money to go to the children's ward and we raised over I think it was three and a half thousand pounds in the three years and that was that was great fun it was absolutely brilliant it really was you've no idea the people that I had to model clothes you know just from Everyday people, my husband worked in a garage at that time. He had some of the mechanics and the salesmen were doing the male modelling. Um, the women in the offices were doing that. I worked in a, in the hospital. I had nurses, male nurses as well, doing, doing the modelling. It was great fun. Absolutely. They were the three things that really, really stood out for me because I organised them, you know. I think I did 90%, 90%. The men hadn't a clue, <laughs> didn't have a clue about fashion or anything like that. So they, they just more or less left me. But I would say to them, um, I need 100 chairs. And one of the gentlemen, I'll get those for you. Um, I could do with such and such. And they would, they would source these things for me. I knew what I wanted. But other than that, they left. But they turned up on the night. They all turned up on the night and they enjoyed it and they sort of opened their eyes what a fashion show was about. It was great fun. Where did you get the clothes from? The Matalan did two of them for me. So we actually did them in the shop once the shop was closed. And the um, clothes, the models all went the week before and picked out outfits and they were put to one side and they modelled the clothes that were on sale in Matalan. Of course, anybody that went on the night got 10 or 25% off if they bought, shopped in the shop after the show. The third show I did with um, Country Casuals in, a, in Inverness, and we actually used the Mercury Hotel, and they put that on. My own hairdressers came, they did all the girls' hair. I had friends who did the makeup, everything. You know, I mean, I just pulled in and people were so willing to do it for nothing because it was charity you know it was really really good it was super fun and such a good cause uh -huh. yes very much so again for the record could you explain what play therapy is please um <clears throat> how to tell you the play therapy this lady works um obviously they've got the children and then maybe been in hospitals traumatic at the best of times and they try to win their confidence um, and even something as simple as them having an injection or taking blood sometimes it can take them a couple of days you know unless it's an absolute um, right emergency to build that child's confidence up but they quite often do that through play through using other mediums and things like that um, and explaining what's going to happen to the child and just working with them but also the other thing was that they have to keep the children occupied when they're in hospital. They can't just lie in bed. Some of them are at an age where they need schooling. Um, but once the, uh, the school sort of day in the hospital is finished, they still they don't, they don't want them just sitting watching TV. So, but you think about um, in a hospital, you've got a child that's using crayons and a colouring book. That can't go to another child because of infection. So... It's a, a one-off use for that child and they either take it home with them when they go home or it has to be destroyed. So they continually needed funds to be able to replenish everyday things for younger children like that. But the older children that are not old enough to go into an adult ward, they're not interested in things like that. They're into games, you know, TV games, things like that. So... Anything, everything, they needed equipment like that, and but stuff that could be disinfected so they could pass that on to other children. 
as well. So it's a, it's, it was a very involved job, very involved job. And it, it, just, it just blew me away when she told us the kind of things that they did. It really did. For all I worked in a hospital, I never knew that that side of things was going on. Mm -hmm. There are so many different aspects to mm -hmm. hospital. Oh, there is, though. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well done. Mm -hmm. um, what other events can you tell me about? Oh, goodness, we've done all sorts. Let me try and think what we've done. Um, well, we do the ordinary things that everybody does. We have had, we have had coffee mornings, as I say, right at the very beginning was a... We did have a garden party at uh, Lord Burton's estate. His wife was a member, Lady Burton, and she uh, opened up the estate and we had um, like daffodil type tea. We also had a, the same thing, another lady who was a member, um, she had a big house along towards uh, Croy and she opened up her gardens and we had uh, teas there as well for everyone that kind of thing. We've had cheese and wine parties, we've had events in the town house, um, like a musical evening in the town house. Um, so we've, we've done quite a bit actually, but then we've done the ordinary things like we've uh, done street collections, collections in the street and we've done um, outside the football ground, bucket collections, you know, turn our hand to anything. Anything that we think will, race nights, race nights are very good, great fun. Very Could you explain good race nights for me, please? A race night is um, where you have a, a big screen in a room and there are so many races that are projected onto that, horse races, and they are all given silly names and they're given um, you're all given a number and you can, it's usually a pound a bet. So you can go and buy tickets. Now you can put five tickets on number one or you can put one pound on one to five something like that and um then the show the race starts and if, the, even i mean young children can do it as well when they're there with their mums and dads and they can do it and they get so excited because their horse is beginning to win you know but even the adults do and they uh, by the end of the evening they're all standing up and screaming at the tele at the screen for their horse to win you know very good fun very good fun you know, so people do get something back from it if they win a couple of pound on a horse, um, but it raises money as well because it's obviously a percentage goes to, to the order. You were members of the association in the early days. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain the work that happens there? The association was um, people, volunteers. They literally were the, as you get now, we get volunteers to help us do virtually everything. You couldn't do uh, any of your fundraising without volunteers. Um, but people who were interested, interested enough in the order, but um, they didn't necessarily want to become members of St. John. So we had this association and it was, they were all volunteers. They did an awful lot of the fundraising. When I first joined, in fact, it was the association that did 90% of the fundraising. It really was. You would get some of the members would come along and join in, but it, it was all organised by the association. But then it wasn't very many years after I joined that it was all amalgamated into one. When did you actually start to sit on the committee? I think more or less straight away once I was invested. That would be 2006, round about that time. So I think I more or less went onto the committee pretty quickly. I think it was when it was the were amalgamated. It would be after they were amalgamated. The two part, the two bodies were amalgamated. I went onto the committee for um, I think more for female a female member than more than anything else. And as I say, Kirsty had been secretary of the association, and then she uh, she did secretary as well. Um, for her dad, for a lot of years, he was chairperson, and she did secretary because Alex stepped down from that, um, because of his work commitments. So she took it on, and I think as I say, a family we just 
did everything together. So I joined the committee as well. Yeah. But then when Kirsty Kirst, Kirst, stepped down and then I did secretary for a while as well after that, you know. So. Could you tell me some of the issues that were discussed at the committee meetings? Oh, my goodness. Well, we used to discuss a um, and well, give an account of the um, what had happened at area area meetings. Always got feedback from that. Um, if there were any questions that were raised, then um, people would raise questions. If they couldn't be answered, then they were noted so that they could be taken back down to Edinburgh. Um, then um, used to discuss things like um, what else would any future fundraising events that we wanted to do, if any events were coming up, who was doing what, you know, all of that kind of thing so that it was organised. If we needed a subcommittee to do anything, um, like when we had the uh, investiture in Inverness, um, that was 2009, I think it was. Um, we had a small subcommittee that dealt purely with doing that and then fed back to the main committee at each meeting and to the chairperson, we discussed um, where we, the money that we raised, where we wanted to disperse it to, um, that kind of thing. So we were able to do all of that. Yeah, so there, was, there were lots of very in-depth discussions. But no, and uh, it was good. The, the meetings were very good and very, very well run, I must admit. Where were they held? Um, we held them, fortunately, through Alec and my husband. They were held in a committee room at the um, Masonic Lodge. So it was a private, proper committee room around a table. Um, and latterly after that, they were held in um, a room in the what a place called the club, which is right next door to the Masonic Lodge. And there was a big sort of room there as well, like an old dining room that we hold uh, the meetings in. And as well. these are in Inverness? In Inverness here itself, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Given that the Highlands is such a vast area, were the meetings well attended? Yeah, well, the committee was quite big and the, the invitation did go out to every single person. I mean, I can vouch for that because I used to send them out myself. Um, and a, you wouldn't really get anybody coming from outside but yet yeah, tell a lie we did get people coming from outside in Venice but locally but not much further afield at all and when um after a while we discovered that an awful lot of the people sort of on the west coast and further into the highlands and that a lot of these people were actually elderly and they they were unable to travel didn't like traveling in the dark weren't able to come and help on um, events because of ill health, that kind of thing, which was fair enough. That happens in any association or any uh, body at all. That happens all the time. Um, and uh, But the, I used to get lovely letters back from people saying they were so sorry they weren't able to do this or, you know, they would phone me and say, before we put everything onto email. And when we went onto email, there was actually very, very few people who... I think there was only about seven or eight who didn't have email addresses. And I used to do that by post. Um, but then eventually people would say to take us off. They were, they were too old and they weren't able to do things to take us off the mailing list, etc. Yeah, so that was that. Where were most of the members located then? In and around Inverness? No, I think there's, um, I mean, we do have, I know of, uh, at the moment we have um, Grenville Johnson as a member. He's in Elgin, as far as field as Elgin, and the Fort William, no, Fort Augustus, not Fort William, Fort Augustus, um, slightly further north, they're in Bewley. They, they, I know, I'm trying to remember the, the mailing list now, down in Aviemore, all kinds of places so it's not centrally the majority are in Inverness but there are people from out, out with Inverness as well. Could you tell me anything about their activities? 
no very limited very li the ones that are in Inverness or are on the outskirts of Inverness will help out immensely I know we've got um through the defibrillators now we've got uh, people up in um Wick up around that area in Thurso um and they are very active on what they're doing at the moment unfortunately because of Covid and everything we haven't been able to get everybody together because I know that's one thing Ramsey would love to do the chairperson he'd love to get everybody together at least once so we can all at least meet you know but that'll come it will come eventually you know <laughs> yeah you mentioned the defibrillators there could you tell me about some of the um the activities that St John Scotland delivers well I know up in a they do do that um that is the big thing at the moment is the the defibrillators and it is unfortunate for uh, we were we were, I will admit, I think we, we were slow in getting off the ground with that. Um, not for any great reason or that it wasn't wanted to be done. It was just circumstances. We were a bit slow in getting off the mark. Plus, we're a small committee up here in a big, big area, a huge, big area. Um, so we're not quite concentrated like the Central Belt or the other bigger cities. Um, so it was, I think it was slower in getting off the ground. But it is now beginning to take off and they they are teaching people it's more the teaching side of thing how to do cpr um more than the defibrillators although i did go with my husband a couple of times and when we gave defibrillators to a golf course in fort rose we presented them with one um and so i know that it ha they have been done that now Prior to that, it was that the majority of things that we did were um, sort of local charities or mountain rescue. And I was uh, that was one of the reasons, I think, right at the very beginning where we did get involved because my son was an avid climber. And we always um, knew we'd support the mountain rescue. We supported them before we ever got involved with St John. You know, if there was any, ever anything we could see, we'd put money into a tin or something like that. For the mountain rescue because Ken and he used to love ice climbing in the winter so we appreciate all the work that they do you know so but a lot a lot of the work was with that and they, eventually we will go when they were being presented with new vehicles you know way over to Glencoe and all sorts of places like that to see them getting new vehicles there are numerous bases numerous um, yes in uh -huh. could, you, could you tell me about any of them well one of them I can't remember the name of it now because we actually went and they had built a purpose-built building for I could show you on a map but I can't remember the name but it might come to me um, and it, they, they were given a piece of land by Lady Rice, Tim Rice's wife she gave them a piece of land at the side of the road and St John's built a purpose-built base for them to keep all their climbing equipment and everything, baths to wash all the road. Because prior to that, they were getting changed at the side of the road. You know, when they rescued somebody off the mountain, they were having to get changed at the side of the road. So I I know of that one. We went up to Ullapool as well. And there's um, all sorts of you know, places. Glencoe. We went to Glencoe as well when they were getting a new vehicle presented. So it's not just vehicles it's bases as well for them to be able to have a base to keep all their equipment i remember alex telling me about the christmas gift tree mm -hmm. the giving tree the giving tree sorry uh -huh. are you were you involved with that yes and no involved in as much as a i think it's a, a huge a great thing it was one of the first things like that of its kind i think in inverness um and long before uh, ever anything else started up I always supported it I still do every single year I support it um, but uh, Alec and his wife are such a team now they've got it so slick really um, it doesn't really involve anybody else because between them and the Eastgate Centre everything is so slick at the way that it is done that uh, you know there really isn't any more personal involvement that's needed other than by going and taking three or four of the cards off the tree 
buying gifts and handing them in the, the, the same way. But it's a fabulous thing, it really is. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. What are the main challenges for St John's Scotland in the Highlands? The main challenges is um, being recognised for who we are. As it's always been said for the, like, the, the last few years, we're the best kept secret. St John is an exceptionally good secret organisation. Not because they do anything secretly, because people don't know who we are at all. And it's trying to get your name out there because I remember once doing a bucket collection in the middle of Inverness and we were wearing the tabards. It was the association tabards because um, it was still at that period. And a couple of ladies coming up to me and quite willingly giving me money for the for the thing. Oh, uh, St John's Ambulance do a great job. And we were associated. For all, I said, no, we're not anything to do with St John's Ambulance. Oh, but you do a great job anyway. And they didn't listen, you know. And if you go to people and you tell, say to people, I'm a member of St John um, in Scotland, what is St John Scotland? They don't have a clue. We're not well enough known. That is the biggest problem. It really is. Could you tell me what ideas you may have for improving the profile of St John's Scotland? Mm -hmm. um, for a long while now, I've uh, thought and, and said at committee meetings that we need to have um, information boards so that whenever we hold an event, irrespective of where it is or what it is, as people come into that event, we've got information of who we are, what we've done in the past, what we are trying to do in the future, um, things like that. Plenty of pictures. You know, there's lots and lots of pictures must be going around um, of things like handing over vehicles to the, um, to the mountain rescue, about the work being done with the de uh, defibrillators, with uh, CPR, just events that we've held in the past and people being there and showing what's done. I think we need that a, a lot of, I think I really do think that that is one of the big, big things. That, so any event that we have, whether it be something formal or it's something informal, wherever it is, whatever the venue, we have these information boards that we can take with us and we can put up and people can have a really good browse and have a look at them. And I think that would be one really big area where it uh, could make a big difference because then it's not just people it's not just word of mouth which gets forgotten if people have seen something visual it is much much better much better indeed i really do and i think we need to be able to if we are i'm a great believer in when we're doing having events as well we need to advertise a lot you know um and yes, we might have to spend a little bit of money, but if we spend a little bit of money and get a good advert, instead of just a small advert, we get a reasonable sized advert and publicise what we're doing before the event as well. Because if you don't publicise, you won't get people coming in at all. Do you think that the um, perhaps lack of a high profile in the islands impacts on your ability to bring in more volunteers yes is it short a and challenge? sweet yes it is a big challenge yes it always has been a big challenge 99 percent, i would say has been word of mouth through a member bringing someone else in um there have been odd people that have joined uh, made inquiries um after an event has been held but it's only things like that because other than that they don't know anything about us so it is it's a very big challenge what would you say is the age range of current volunteers it's very high very high um to get younger people in i mean even to get gentle ladies and gentlemen i would say from the 30s 40s and above um, or even that age range they're so busy with family life they have their, you know their children if they've got young children their children are growing up um, and they can't dedicate the time and when they do get a little bit of time what do they want to do they just want to relax and recharge their own batteries 
you know, they really do. So um, our committee and our members are quite a bit higher. What do you think could be done to perhaps attract more volunteers? Well, that is a difficult one. It really is because I think every, every way, every group, no matter what it is, are struggling to get younger people in. And I think a lot of it is to do with, um, as I say, busy, busy family lives, but also the amount of a uh, sort of high tech things as well. And if you're not high tech minded, you tend to get left behind. I feel very left behind in the technical world. But by the same token, I'm quite happy with that. <laughs> Taking a wee um, slight tangent, could you tell me about your investiture? Yes, it was lovely. And it was, it was just a super day, you know, it really was. Everybody that was involved in organising it made me feel so at ease. Um, so welcome. Um, they went through everything that would be happening. Um, and it just, right from the very minute of getting the letter through to say that you'd been put forward for it and would you accept, it was just a bit of a buzz, you know, and a culmination and thinking, uh, you know, oh, I'm so pleased and, and to be able to go on and do more for years to come. And when it actually, I was, um, actually had my insignia pinned to my top, I was just so proud. I really was so, so proud. It was lovely. And it was just a really nice day. And every you, everybody is on an equal. You know, it didn't matter who you were or what you had done, what you were planning to do. You were just a member. You were there. It was lovely. It was a really nice day. How many people attended that day? Oh, there were a good few hundred. Mm -hmm. I would say between possibly a couple of hundred. Maybe, you know, maybe maybe slightly below, slightly more, something like that. But it, um, it certainly, it was a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, I know we, because I know we did an investor here in Inverness, so I know how many people roughly attend. Mm -hmm. um, just coming back to volunteers, if you were doing a publicity advert, um, what would you say to attract volunteers? What, what are the benefits of, of being a member of St John's Scotland? Hmm. Well, one of the biggest benefits is being much part of a, a being part of a much wider organisation than you ever realise at local level. It is worldwide, and no matter where in the world you would go, you would always find a Saint John um, group there um, of very like-minded people might be specific to their own country but they are there the historic side of it is phenomenal if you're a history buff then the saint john is for you it's not ju not just like a um joining a group because you like what they do the history behind it is phenomenal right the way back to the crusades it really is and then obviously you have your local level what you can do at local level you have a national level as well um so there are various different things and you can communicate between all the other groups and find out what they're doing and um but you've all got the same goal at the end to make life for people better than what they've got at the moment that's the way i look at it trying to make life better for people than what they have just now has the organisation been involved in any particular campaigns at all? <clears throat> I think the one thing I... One thing in a way that uh, disappointed me was a kind of, um, it's something that they've been involved in is a, in Malawi. They're involved in Malawi. But it's very, very little feedback that comes from that you know and um i have no i think it's great that we can help other countries and help it um vastly any charity can and the help is needed throughout the world let's face it 
Um, but the fact that we are so much wanting to do these things, but we get so little feedback about what happens. We get feedback from the eye hospital, um, which is great. And I love the, the fact that we support the eye hospital um, and we get newsletters from them, etc., on a regular basis. But any of the other projects that the, they do in other countries, we get virtually no, well, I've had virtually no feedback about what um, what they're doing I don't want to know how much money they're spending there, but what the project is, what it entails, how it is moving forward and after so many years, what point have they reached, things like that. Um, I don't know anything about that at all. And Malawi's one that um, sort of jumps to mind. There, there may well be others as well. Thank you. How has St John's Scotland changed since you've been, you were first involved? When we first got involved with St John's Scotland at St John's House in Edinburgh and I think there were four people who ran St John's, believe it or not, there was a, a gentleman there whose name I, Waller, Mr Waller, his name will come to me. There was a lady called Janet who was the um, accountant and then there was another lady who did the admin, admin, Joan was her name, but she left and it was a lady, um, I can't remember her name now. And they ran the office, they organised all of the investitures and they had the prior and obviously they had the meetings there and that was it. But since then it has grown so much and I feel it's become more like a corporate business than it than it was. Still do the same work, but there just seems to be so many more, more people who do the work of those few people that were there. I know they've got progress. Progress has to happen. Um, it's become, as you say, like, probably was, it was a registered charity. It's become, is it a limited charity? Limited now? I can't remember. I can't remember. I went to very, two or three, quite a few meetings where they were talking about the change of what was going to happen and things like that. Um, so that I know it has grown enormously and there would be people that were needed to do different sections and different jobs there now. But that is the biggest change that I've seen. Um, but the where we had autonomy here on our committee where we could just make a lot of decisions ourselves, that seems to have been taken away or in, it's more centralised, you know, and yes, we've got things that, um, campaigns to follow, like the defibrillators, like the patient transport, all that kind of thing, but some of these are not suitable to the Highlands. The Highlands already had a great system for patient transport up here anyway, um, and, um, and various things like that, um, but there were times when we felt that we weren't listen to you know you will do what we are doing in the central belt and it doesn't central belt it isn't the highlands you know it definitely isn't and they that's that's my biggest feeling thank you very much um what do you think to the gender balance i think the gender balance could be an awful lot better um I no doubt maybe some of the committees, um, I, I really don't know, some of them may have a more equal balance than there is. Um, but certainly here in the Highlands, I think there are four, maybe five ladies on the committee. Um, and we are active, very active. I'm very outspoken. I will admit. How many members um, are there on the committee? I think we average around between 12 and 15. You know, and if we can get a um, a good balance on it, because you can't get everybody every 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 meeting, because everybody has their own personal um, things to do. You know, so uh, we probably average around about 8 to 10. But we've got got up to about fifteen, I think, that 
Ja, uh, for the commission. And about five of those of women? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, do you think that overall St John Scotland is still as relevant as it used to be? Yes, I do. Um, but on the back of that, seeing that we aren't, we could be an awful lot more relevant because we aren't well enough known. And well, I don't think the relevance has changed any. It's the fact that we aren't known well enough. The job and the work that we do is very, very relevant, extremely so. Just we need a much better profile than we've got. Much, much better profile. What's your hopes for the future of St John's Scotland? My hopes would be that we can, uh, as I say, we can develop more and become much wider known. And I think that is the key thing, especially up here in the Highlands, probably better different in the central belt, but here in the Highlands, we really, really do need to be much better known. And I think once we are much better known, um, we will get a much better following. We might get more people that would want to come and volunteer. We might more people that want to be very active in the uh, movement and things like that. But the priority, is to make our profile much, much better here in the Highlands. Thank you. Could you sum up what you think is the best thing about St John's Scotland? Oh, best thing. There have been so many things, but I think all, over, over the time, it's the people that I've come to meet, um, friendships that I never would have had before, um, just the ethos of what St John is all about, um, that I greatly believe in, right across the board. I don't think there's anything that I disagree with what they do um, at all. And um, no, I think that that is it. It's like a, and when you go to every, uh, go to meetings down south, everybody comes together and it's not a case of, oh, that you're from there or you're from there. It's, oh, sorry, that's my phone now. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's just that um, everybody's on the same wavelength, doing the same thing, you know. So when you get together as a big group, you're all doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's all of my questions. Okay. Is there anything you would like to add? Have I missed anything? I can't, I can't think you've missed anything at all. No. No, just maybe one or two bits there that <laughs> maybe sort my mouth a bit too much, but never will we'll, we can sort that out, but no, no, I think that's fine. Well, thank you very much. Very no, much you're more than welcome. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You.